Good evening, dear Medioscope viewers. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. This week, medical doctor and healthcare IT executive, Dr. Ushil Arujan will be joining us from California. But firstly, let's take a look at this week's developments. As of May 7th, Turkey's death toll from the coronavirus is 3,641. The total number of positive cases has risen to 133,721. Turkey will start ease restrictions against the coronavirus as early as this weekend, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan announced on May 4th. Erdogan said people under the age of 20 and over 65 will be allowed to go outside for four hours for one day a week. The implementation will be put into execution on May 10th between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. Children in the age group 0 to 14 will be allowed to go outside between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. on May 13th whereas those in the age group 15 to 20 will be allowed to leave their homes on May 15th during the same hours. Hairdressers and barber shops will be reopened as of May 11th. They will remain as such as long as they abide by normalization rules, including allowing a limited number of customers inside with strict hygiene and social distancing rules. Erdogan said universities would return to their academic calendar as of June 15th. All stores and shopping malls were also given the green light to open up shop, so long as they too follow normalization rules. Erdogan further announced that travel restrictions will be lifted for seven provinces. These provinces are Erzurum, Aydın, Hatay, Malatya, Mersin, Antalya and Muğla. Entrance and exit bans will stay in place for Istanbul, Ankara and Izmir. Erdogan also announced that the government is lifting the ban on the sale of face masks, which are obligatory to wear in public places. No details were provided as to how and where the sales will be conducted. It was also decided to bring forward the nationwide university admission exams of this year to an earlier date, June 27th and 28th. At the end of March, authorities had announced that the 2020 university exam would be held on July 25th and 26th within the scope of coronavirus measures. The change of date drew reaction on social media as youngsters launched the hashtag Sandıkta Görüşürüz. We'll see you at the ballot box on Twitter. Erdogan added that the national solidarity campaign to raise money to fight the virus and its impact had netted some 1.91 billion Turkish liras in donations. The Turkish Football Federation plans to restart the country's professional football leagues on June 12. This decision was met with mixed reactions. The foundation's president chief Nihat Özdemir announced on May 6 that the Super League the first division, the second division, the third division and the regional amateur leagues suspended on March 19th due to the coronavirus pandemic will resume on June 12th behind closed doors and be completed by the end of July. Although Özdemir said that the decision was taken after consultations with the health ministry and the coronavirus science board, health minister Fahrettin Koca said his ministry had no say in the federation's decision. The federation took the decision at its own initiative. Therefore, the responsibility falls on the federation, Koca told reporters hours after the decision was announced. Although the federation said all measures to protect the health of the players and staff will be taken, some clubs are not convinced. All professional clubs are required to have their players tested according to the protocol announced by the TFF. Super League club Konya Spor argued that a protocol prepared by the TFF to set the rules for the league's return was not applicable. Sivas Spor coach Rıza Çalımbay said the date set for the restart of the leagues was wrong, very wrong. Çalımbay argued that most of his players were concerned and did not want to play, questioning how they can perform their best under such circumstances. Beşiktaş Vice President Adnan Dalkaran said the conditions must change before the leagues can restart. It is actually difficult to play when there are 1,500 to 2,000 daily cases, he said. The Federation took this decision, believing that the situation will get better and emphasized that the date has been set based on the current conditions and predictions. Super League club Trabzonspor, meanwhile, refuted reports that the club did not want the league competition to resume. We will obey whatever the decision the state takes, said Ahmet Aoğlu, president of the club. Aoğlu said the final decision will be taken by the government, not the TFF. The TFF neither has the information on how the coronavirus pandemic will continue, nor has the authority to decide on issues related to the matter, he said.
This week, Dr. Ushin Arijan is joining us from California. Dr. Arijan is a medical doctor and healthcare IT executive. Good evening, Dr. Arijan. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. Thanks for uh, having me. Uh, could you tell us about the use of digital health applications in the management of COVID-19? I know you haven't been in Turkey for many years now, but do you have a general idea perhaps of how these technologies might be applied here? Sure. Um, just to start with, um, let me start with saying I'm a medical doctor by background, but have been working in the healthcare uh, IT industry for the past um, 10 to 11 years in the United States. Um, and uh, I oversee um, an ambulatory um, IS and portals and digital health components um, in, in, in a major healthcare institution here. So some of the things that we have been doing by using um, digital health or information system technologies to help with the COVID situation is of course starts with testing. Um, one of the key things is to ensure that we identify the appropriate people for testing and keep them isolated from the other patients in case that they are in fact, in fact infected. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did here is to establish a virtual uh, clinic, uh, which means the patient, when the patient calls the um, when the patient calls the clinic to make an appointment, they go through a triage of questions to determine whether they are actually calling with any complaints related to COVID. Um, and if they do, then instead of actually inviting the patients to, um, to be seen in the clinic in person, we refer, to, we, we refer them to a virtual telehealth clinic that is staffed by our primary care physicians. So the patient actually connects with the physician from their home via video visit, and the physician um, is able to assess the patient, their condition, and their complaint. And if the physician determines that the patient might in fact be a COVID patient, they refer them to testing without actually patient leaving their home and putting others in risk and also putting our pro providers at risk. So that's one, one part that we can provide with the, with the digital health to be able to convert some of the visits to telehealth visits to help with the patient isolation. Um, the other things, uh, obviously for those patients that are not potential COVID patients or have COVID related complaints, that's another issue because those patients now do not wanna come to clinic uh, in with the fear of getting infected by another patient, they're um, either symptomatic or asymptomatic. So what we did is um, in our organization is to put um, some infrastructure in place in a very, very quick um, turnaround time to allow majority of the non-COVID related ambulatory visits to be conducted via telehealth as well. Of course, not every visit can be conducted via telehealth. For example, if it's a you know, gynecological examination, you cannot do a telehealth visit. But there are many visits that can be conducted telehealth, like um, via telehealth, like behavioral health, or any other follow-up visits, post-surgical visits, um, even some dermatology complaints that can be handled via video camera and such. So essentially we converted about 50% of our visit volume to telehealth visit to be able to support the needs um, of our patients um, and our clinicians and also to comply with the social distancing measures that we have in place here. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, you know, when you think about the social distancing, it goes beyond the patient and provider interaction actually. You have to also think about the patients in the hospital um, and the use of protective personal equipment. Um, so for example, if a patient has a COVID um, suspicion, Every time a provider is interacts with the patient, they have to be in a full protective equipment gear, which is we know there is shortages across the world um, in, in, in here too, and as well as I believe in Turkey and other places, that's um, the mask, surgical mask and the overall protective uh, personal equipment shortage became a major issue in the COVID outbreak. So one way we helped uh, with this, again, using by digital health technologies is to implement um, some video uh, technology in patient rooms uh, when the patient is um, actually hospitalized. So um, one, we, I, I work in a pediatric hospital, so obviously most of our patients are kids and they have 
um, their parents accompanying them. And normally we do allow the, both parents to be in the room with the kids. We had to unfortunately decrease that number to a single parent in order to comply with the social distancing. So we installed some technology to allow the other parent to see the patient room outside from their home so they can be as a family, you know, in a virtual sense. Similarly, for any consult consultations that need to happen or any um, visits, I'm, I work in an educational hospital, um, part of a school of medicine. So obviously there are rounds with many residents, but in the past when there were rounds, many of the residents would be in the patient room with the patient, but now we're doing those with the video visits as well. So I think digital health can help a lot with the social distancing and also isolation of the suspected cases and containing the disease. So these are some of the things that we do um, from that perspective. Obviously we do a lot of stuff with analytics and tracking the patients and flagging the patients as well. Yeah, it seems like you have acted quickly in order to prevent the spread of the virus, and, uh, and that's wonderful. But as you know, both in Turkey and elsewhere around Europe, uh, many countries are now loosening some of the precautions, precautions taken in order to, uh, you know, uh, to contain the virus and prevent it from spreading. Um, independent, obviously, from economic reasons, do you believe this is too early? Um, especially, for example, when we consider Istanbul, which is a city of 16 million inhabitants, and this uh, renders social distancing nearly impossible, uh, what kind of consequences are you expecting? Will uh, the rates of infection, infection drastically increase if people feel like you know, the danger is over? Yeah, well, that's a tough question because I think uh, it has so many different factors um, in it. Uh, first of all, every country's um, case is unique and different. For example, even um, I live in the United States and when we look at the United States, we've seen very different pictures between California versus New York. Obviously, the the population um, density is a big factor and how people are um, trained or um, educated um, to um, follow social distancing guidelines is another factor and how the governments and the infrastructure supports them while doing so is, is the other one. Um, we are living in a very tough time, I think, in the world uh, and the, many of the world and the businesses are shut down for two months in everywhere. And in everywhere also the peak of the infection timing is different. So um, the, you know, the outcome of those kind of like relaxations will be differ, different from country to country, whether they're following the scientific guidelines or acting out of more economical concerns will make a huge difference, I think. Um, in California, which is where I live, our governor uh, made a comment that um, even though um, federal government, Trump government is now um, opening many of the states and encouraging many of the states to fully open, um, California is taking a very, very precautious um, approach. Um, of um, making it in phases and with very, very hard deadlines. So for example, if you go to a supermarket today here, um, you cannot just enter it. Um, there are certain enough number of people that are allowed at any given time. All the cars are sanitized and then even inside you cannot um, approach to another person uh, more than two meters. So I think those kind of precautions will show us how this can be done. Obviously, shutting down a country is for a long time is not something sustainable. There are many businesses and many people who have to work and many services that people rely on. So I do anticipate in everywhere in the world, there will be some sort of like an opening up, but I think how the leaders handle that and how the public health um, institutions um, suggestions are listened to what extent will make a huge difference because uh, there are ways to open certain things um, that are um, essential but of course we need to make sure that the appropriate precautions and social distancing measures and um, hygiene is in place. Uh, for example I was talking to a friend who lives in Europe and he was telling that the place that he works now has actually a maximum number of people who can be allowed in the building at any given time. So for example, if you are a 50 people team, you cannot be there all 50 of you anymore. It's like more like only 10 people will be allowed at any given time. So the businesses will have to make those adjustments. Um, but of course, those adjustments should be also um, 
provided or guide, guide guardrails and guidelines for those adjustments should be provided by the governments um, to allow the businesses continue in a safe way. Um, I do anticipate if, if, if any government opens up very prematurely without these precautions, I do anticipate we will have a peak in the cases. Mm -hmm. In fact, in United States, some of the states already did that and they opened um, with not so many precautions as we would like to see. And uh, we have been seeing number of cases now increasing there. Um, so I think how the governments will handle this opening up will make a huge difference across the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm assuming that obviously governments rely on certain data in order to uh, remove the, de I mean, begin deconfinement measures. What sort of data do they rely on in order to uh, go about this process? Uh, for example, again, uh, giving an example from Turkey, the first uh, on Monday, uh, shopping malls are, for example, reopening and the university exam has been brought forward and both of these, uh, I mean, both of these entail large crowds coming together in enclosed spaces. And, uh, you know, I've read that there are some, uh, there's research coming out of Singapore, China, and South Korea, which provides uh, information stating that the virus spreads qu more quickly in closed and conditions locations. Mm -hmm. So what type of data uh, is important when, um, s when thinking about deconfinement measurements, measures? Yeah, and I think um, the, it's it's a great question because I think the data in the COVID has been always an issue. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a like a standard set of data that every government complies. And the testing, um, the testing uh, ratios in every um, country is different. So we have the number of disease. Num I'm sorry, we have the number of cases um, reported out, but we don't know, we don't have like a standard number of testing uh, available. So the number of cases only reflects the number of people who are tested. So if you don't test a lot of people, obviously that number will be low. Um, so I think uh, tracking closely, I mean, one, extending the testing to a larger population is a key factor. And that's what many of the organizations and um, ad advising for, and many of the governments, I, I hope, will follow that. Because the more people we test, we will be able to know who's, who is actively sick, and who actually got this disease without maybe any symptoms and already immunized, so it can continue to carry on essential business functions. And uh, what is the ratio of um, people being sick in the population, which will make a huge difference how we, um, how we manage this thing. Um, Besides that, obviously, the number of um, symptomatic cases and how they climb up is important. Um, following number of deaths is, is important. One thing we need, to f we need to be mindful of, I think we tend to react very fast when we see like a little dip in the numbers in anywhere, but we have to remember those numbers actually represent like 14 days of active cases. So, um, you know, they're like still many people who might be sick and not dead yet um, might be hidden in the numbers. So um, it's not my area, like um, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I, 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 I'm kind of hesitant to make more comments on this, but obviously making sure the data is clean and standard and tracked in, a, in an appropriate way is a key factor. Um, you mentioned uh, things like university exam or, um, or opening the shopping centers. Obviously, you know, there are ways to do it right and i hope those will be followed um so like opening and um opening uh, shopping centers might mean opening them uncontrollably where we see many people you know eating in the cafeterias and going and getting out of the you know like uh, clothing stores and whatnot which ob obviously will have a very bad consequences because person to person contact is something that makes this disease uh, spread very fastly but they can also be opened in a very limited way um, for example here what they're doing is that some of the clothing stores are opening in california but the way that they're going to do is that they do not allow people to go into store they do not allow people to touch any you know clothes or try them on you can order them online and you pick up them on the curbside or outside of the of the store so how you approach to a problem is a big um big um part of the solution i think um university exam um i heard that it was um the date was changed 
um, and obviously having a 50 young kid in a single classroom does not sound like a good idea in this <laughs> pandemic. But if they have a way to keep them separate and you know separate enough to be able to accommodate the social distancing that might or maybe do an online exam you know that that would be the best option actually well, we'll see how they will uh, revise their decision maybe uh, in the days to come. Uh, but Dr. Arijan, in terms of the digital health applications, uh, are there new ones that are going to be uh, tried out during this, this uh, deconfinement procedures in order to have more effective control and monitoring? Yeah, um, I talked about in length uh, about the telehealth and video um, conferences. So that is more like managing and helping people out. But um, there has been a lot of discussions going on about contra contact tracing right now. Uh, one of the key things is obviously once we are somehow able to contain this um, pandemic, um, the, one of the key things that we want to make sure that we are able to identify any new cases and track back who that person has been in contact with in the past two weeks. Um, so this is an interesting dilemma because it comes up with a lot of available technology use actually like um, there's been a lot of talk about using cell phones as a contact tracing because you know all of our cell phones has a location indicator in them and we can actually track back where we have been with the locations in google map like you look at google map and you're able to see like where you have been in the past two weeks for sure so that's the technology that can be used to track back who this person might have been infected in the past two weeks. But of course, it's a double-edged sword because it comes with a lot of privacy concerns. Like, do we want governments to track where we have been or whom we have been in the past two weeks continuously? Um, for, I mean, many of the people I know, including myself, would not be comfortable with that because that's very intrusive, I think. Um, but um, that's, that's the technology that is available. So we want to track people, it's doable, but do we want to do it? That's a tough question. <laughs> Um, and, and lastly, Dr. Arajan, um, in your opinion, what will our new normal look like? Um, is the possibility of getting infected intrinsic to our new understanding of the normal? Yeah, new normal is the new uh, <laughs> terminology that we all use now nowadays. Um, I think we're going through a very tough time. And, um, but I also think that we are very lucky because this infectious might have been much more deadlier. Um, so hopefully after this, in our new normal, my, my biggest hope is that we will end up learning a lot from this pandemic to prevent us from, you know, being killed in a much more serious uh, one in the future. Um, but just to be realistic, I, I, I see a lot of like very pessimistic approaches and then I see very optimistic approaches just for the sake of balance and you know being realistic. I think the, the next two years will be very different than what we are used to. Um, I do see a lot of like um, very optimistic news about like a vaccine is found and a medication is found even First of all, um, no vaccine has been found in a couple months. And I have, I'm very skeptical about any of the vaccine or cure um, announcements made uh, prematurely in many uh, instances. I think we won't have a vaccine in the next 18 to 24 months, months. Um, at least not a vaccine that we can fully, uh, it's fully tested and actually fully manufactured and available to everyone. So I think we will have two years, a tough two years, ahead of us um, with very different social dynamics with social distancing in place and maybe limiting many of our activities for example movie theaters and concerts and crowded bars will will be a thing that we will remember probably um, hopefully after two years and once we have the vaccine we can go back like for me i love going to concerts and that's the biggest um you know one of the biggest worries similarly travel will be tough um, i think one way to get over these is that if we end up determining many people already actually got this disease and we are immune to it and we are um, convinced that uh, it's not something we can get again then life can go back to normal earlier but unless those things happen um, and a vaccine is found, I do see the social distancing becoming part of our new normal for, for the future until we have a better way to make sure that we don't get infected. And if we do get infected, we don't get 
too sick. Dr. Ushul Arujan, thank you so much for your insights and for uh, joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. People's Democratic Party lawmaker and investigative journalist Ahmed Shuk announced his resignation from the party on May 4th. In a Twitter post, Shuk stated, I resign from the HDP because of a dominant understanding among the party's management, excluding our co-chairs, insisting on an approach contrary to democratic practices and to the HDP's strength, meaning and values. Shuk said that he gave his resignation to the party on April 1st. The decision was made official on May 4th. He said that his decision was a reflection of an individual political approach and said should not be a matter for conspiracy theories. After Shuk declared his resignation, the HDP issued a written statement saying, We have worked with Mr. Ahmed Shuk since the June 2018 elections and have been in efforts together. The resignation is his own decision. The HDP will continue its works aware of its political and historical responsibility. An investigative journalist, Shuk is known for his book The Imam's Army, published in 2011, which exposed the infiltration of the Gulen network into police force and other civil institutions. At the time, the book was banned by the government, as it claimed that its publication was linked to the Ergenekon group, an alleged conspiracy of secular ultranationalists who aimed to launch a coup in Turkey. People's Republican Party chairman, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, addressed reporters at the party's headquarters. Kılıçdaroğlu criticized the policies and positions of President Erdogan, also addressing early election claims and coup d'etat discussions. Kılıçdaroğlu stated that Erdogan will not be able to keep ruling the country with his policies that have negatively affected democracy, freedoms and the economy. Every person remains in power for a certain period of time until he can no longer win votes. And this is the case with Erdogan, Kılıçdaroğlu explained. He further stressed that the coronavirus outbreak in Turkey has allowed the people to realize that the situation will not return to the way it was before, saying the government has failed to properly handle the crisis. President Erdogan had targeted the CHP in his addresses over the past weeks, accusing the party of having putschist mentality that wanted to sabotage the government's management of the coronavirus pandemic. Kılıçdaroğlu has stated that Erdogan wanted to pull discussions in a different direction in order to divert from the disastrous economy and his decline in popularity. Kılıçdaroğlu reiterated that the CHP supported democracy, but that the country was being run by a single man. And thus, if there were to be early elections, it was going to be the decision of Erdogan and not conducted on democratic grounds. The music band Grup Yorum announced that their bass player, Ibrahim Gökçek, has lost his life at the hospital where he was being treated after ending his 322-day-long death fast two days ago. Merhaba, madeni yeryüzüne ulaştıranlar. Seven Group Yorum musicians were arrested during a police raid in November 2016 on claims of resisting and insulting a police officer and membership to a terrorist organization. On May 17, 2019, arrested musicians Helin Bölek, Bahar Kurt, Barış Yüksel, Ibrahim Gökçek and Ali Aracı released a statement where they detailed the pressure they faced in relation to the prohibition of their concerts and the raids conducted to their cultural center. They announced that they would begin a hunger strike and would not end it unless their demands were met by the government. On the 201st day of his hunger strike, Ibrahim Gökçek declared that he was now on a death fast. Gökçek was given a report by the Forensic Medicine Institution stating that he could no longer stay in prison. As a result, he was released. Due to the lack of a positive response by government officials relating to their requests, including the ban on their concerts to be lifted, the removal of the group's members' names from terror lists, and an end to the raids of Idil Cultural Center, where the group carries out its works, Bölek and Gökçek continued their death fasts. Bölek lost her life on the 288th day of her death fast on April 3, 2020. After the band applied to the governor's office of Istanbul to hold a concert, Ibrahim Gökçek ended his death fast on the 323rd day and was taken to a hospital in an ambulance on May 5, 2020. Gökçek lost his life at the hospital two days later on May 7th. That's all from this week in Turkey. See you next Friday at 8 p.m. Good night.